to me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. Welcome, neighbors, to the Sinos with your host, Maria Garcia. Good morning. Welcome to Vecinos. Our show today will be a very pertinent show in that we're going to talk about development in San Diego and about affordable housing. My guest today is Ricardo Flores, Executive Direct Director of LISC, a program whose office is in City Heights. Prior to discussing LISC, I would like to, and, and the plans they have for our future, I would like to tell, tell like Ricardo to tell us a little bit about himself, where he grew up, what his interests are, his schooling. Ricardo, welcome to Vecinos. Thank you so much for having me. Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a proud second-generation San Diegan, uh, originally from City Heights. Um, I, my folks are, as you know, retired elementary school principals here in San Diego Unified, and so I think they instilled in me and my sister uh, kind of the belief of giving back and making sure that you're doing something uh, above and beyond for your community. Um, I actually went off to UCLA and went and got a film degree. So I have a film student at UCLA and worked in the film industry for a little while and uh, had an opportunity to work on Shrek 2, the movie. Uh, and when that ended, I decided to go abroad and uh, go to Barcelona and, and do what I know best, which is I speak English and Spanish. And I was an English teacher for a year and came back to San Diego and got a job with a local congresswoman named Congresswoman Susan Davis, and that kind of started me on my career and path towards public service. Okay. You've left out a lot of important things <laughs> about you. Tell us a little bit about your political activism it, as a young boy. I'm talking about your high school, college days. Yeah, my, my folks were, as you know, very much interested and very much involved with the community, the Latino community here in San Diego, and the activists uh, themselves. Uh, and so I think that when we were younger, we were part of boycotts and we were part of uh, walking door to door for candidates. So, you know, early on, I think we got an appreciation of, of doing things above and beyond. And, and all of the friends that they had uh, from their days in, in school, from in, uh, a university and also from, from their work, uh, were also very much involved. So we, I think we grew up in an environment where, uh, you know, boycotting grapes. I mean, I remember for years not eating grapes. And then when one opportunity, one time we, you know, the opportunity came, we, okay, you can have grapes now. Um, you know, watching movies like El Norte, you know, uh, going, making sure that we saw uh, plays that came on the San Diego, like Zoot Suit and other things. I think they were very much involved in getting us that kind of cultural background, but also political background uh, to ensure that we got involved. And I think it, spent, it stemmed from them. I mean, they were first generation uh, to go to college. Um, you know, they were administrators or teachers, and I think that anybody that knows uh, folks that are teachers or administrators in, in, in school settings know that you go, your work goes beyond the classroom oftentimes, and it goes into the community and one of the challenges the community faces. And so uh, I think that me and my sister saw that and role modeled that. And interestingly enough, we both started in the private sector, uh, and then both of us sort of changed our career path. My sister later became, worked in education, and then, of course, I went into politics, and now as an executive director for a nonprofit. So I think it instilled a great deal about, um, about our background and, and kind of an appreciation for who we are. And also I think it grounds you. It grounds you in your own community because it, it gives you the opportunity to know that you were a part of something larger. You know, years ago we found a picture of my dad when I was making a documentary on Chicano Park as a, a child, really, as a junior high student. And we found a picture of him actually uh, helping uh, uh, make, uh, create Chicano Park. Uh, you know, during the, the protests. And so to be able to know that you, your family has a connection to that, and not just your family, but other people that they know and that you know, I think that instills a, a sense of your belonging. So, And a, a sense of you need to do something. You can't sit back. And I know, knowing your parents, right. I know that was never the plan for you to just sit back and watch right. the world go by. Exactly. I would venture to say the majority of San Diegans are not familiar with LISC. Uh, can you give us a Reader's Digest version of what it is and what it stands for. Yeah, so LISC is the, it's the acronym is the, uh, the, the actual spelling is the Local Initiative Support Corporation. It's a nationwide nonprofit. It's been around since 1979. And essentially what we are is we are a community development financial institution. So more common CDFIs to the public are like your credit unions. So we are, in effect, a non-depository CDFI. So we don't take deposits from the public. But because we are a CDFI, we are able to get loans from banks because of their Community Reinvestment Act obligations. And so they provide us hundreds of millions of dollars in loans. And what we do is we 
then take those loan, low interest loans and we underwrite them for projects around the, any, around the United States for affordable housing, uh, retail space, child care center, schools, you name it. The idea is that we're trying to help ensure that inner city communities get access to resources, capital, money essentially, to be able to make changes in their community. And the way we do it is we, we try and work, uh, our, our traditional models to work with community development corporations. Uh, CDCs are very common on the East Coast. They're common here. We have uh, uh, several of them here. Sherman Heights, Sherman Heights uh, Community Center is a CDC. Uh, City Heights uh, uh, CDC. City Heights Community Center is also a CDC. And, and really what we try and do with those local community groups that are into development is we try to really help them build their capacity so that they, uh, they're able to either take a loan buy property, manage property, or at the very best scenario, build a property of housing. Because uh, what better way than a group of people from a community coming together, being able to partner with a developer and build affordable housing in their own community, uh, decide what they want their community to look like, the architecture, decide if there's a commercial space that they would like to have in that, sp- in that area. Um, so it's very empowering. And I think you're seeing a lot of the, and this is very important right now in San Diego, we're seeing a lot of this in Body of Logan. Um, obviously, there's a lot of changes going on in that community, and communities like that actually have the ability, uh, and ha- there's access to capital out there, and there's access to resources out there for communities like that to be able to buy land and to land bank it or to put it in so, so that the, the community owns a piece of land and the community partners with a responsible developer to build affordable housing for themselves. They get to, you know, they could design what it looks like. So it's very empowering. Um, so in, in a sense, it's a very pertinent uh, organization to work for, especially right now when we're seeing so much change in our communities. My question, but you may have already answered it, why is it important to San Diego? I mean, why should San Diego say, oh, this is a program we need? Well, you know, the, the thing about LISC is, so what LISC does is we will go into where banks are not comfortable making loans. Uh, we, will, we will, and traditionally what we do is we, we provide funding, and we're talking millions of dollars in funding. I mean, we did $5 million in funding last year of loans. We will provide funding to buy land or to buy a property. And your traditional banks don't do, won't get into that space because it's very risky. And if you think about it from their perspective, if you go to a bank and you say, hey, I need $2 million to buy a piece of land on El Cajon Boulevard, they don't know anything about the land on El Cajon Boulevard. They don't have no idea how you're going to pay them back. And so they're probably not going to accept your loan uh, request. But a group like LISC can come in and we're much more patient. We're not interested, like a bank, in getting our money back right away. We're interested in developing a relationship. But we are crucial to that financial piece. Uh, because, again, the system, when you build anything, it's relying upon financing. And so we're a nonprofit financer, and our mission isn't for profit, our mission is simply to get the, those monies out there. And the other thing to think about is, I mean, there's trillions of dollars of money in the market, as they say, right? Um, that money is just circulating. It's money that you and I have invested for pensions. It's money that you and I have invested in our banks or our credit unions, whatnot. The question becomes, how do you get that money that's circulating in New York or in London or anywhere around the world, how do you get that into your own little community? How do you find, how does that, how do you do that? And traditionally, we do it with banks. But banks then have to send somebody out to that community to understand that community. And they have to make an evaluation of whether or not this is a thing that the bank should get involved in. And you can see that when you're dealing with inner city communities, there's a lot more complexity than whether or not you're going to make a profit here. Um, there's, there's historical issues. There's cultural issues. Um, and so LISC is able to come in, essentially, and provide that underwriting, uh, provide those loans. And by us doing that, we effectively will bring the market with us. We'll bring banks with us because banks will see, oh, you're underwriting something here. Then there must be some value here that we can also partake in. Uh, so it's really important because, again, we, if we talk about communities and we talk about the fact that uh, inner city communities lack access to capital, that there's no investment in their communities. Well, here you have a nonprofit in San Diego They can do all of that. And most importantly, we can speak the same language that the financial industry, that banks speak. So when we're underwriting, we can explain what we're doing and why we're doing it, and we can create a story that's very important for that community as well. So you're almost like a translator between a business or the community and the bank. Exactly. And that's why, actually, it's a very 
it's very insightful you say that because Lisk, the, 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 the name is local. The first word in our, the first letter in our, our title is local. And the reason why it's local is for that reason alone, that we are that bridge, that we will work, let's say, with, uh, with a community development organization like the Sherman Heights Community Center or whatnot. And we will also work with banking partners and we're there to kind of straddle that world. And, and we go beyond just providing loans. We will actually provide technical assistance. We will actually give people the know-how and the tools. Um, we're, uh, the federal government uh, is very gracious to us, and they provide a LISC, our national office, with what's called HUD Section 4 monies, and not to be confused with HUD Section 8, which is a, a program to help folks um, pay their rent. But HUD Section 4 are essentially monies to build the capacity of a nonprofit, and so we can go into nonprofits like the City Heights CDC, provide them HUD Section 4 money, help them hire and build up their capabilities, and then provide them those loans, those very high loans, those millions of dollars in loans to do something really good in their community. So it's a great organization, uh, and it's, I'm proud to be part of it. Not being a business person, I can't <laughs> deal with millions of dollars in loans. That would scare me to death. Is that something you find in the community you're working with when you start talking money? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a big challenge. Um, I mean, you're essentially a, 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 we're essentially a, a bank, if you will, that's able and has access to, and last year alone listed $300, uh, $300 million in loans around the country. We'll be back in a moment and talk more about our, our program and your program. Thank you so much, Ricardo. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. podcast or radio show on WS Radio is a great way to create content marketing. Turn prospects into customers into raving fans. Contact Wade at WSRadio.com or call 866-WS-RADIO. The richness of your life is reflected in the shimmering elegance found at D.O. Loon Design. One-of-a-kind jewelry and pieces from Cynthia Dillon in silver and gold help to express your unique personality. The flowing designs of her creations will empower the way you move throughout your day. Join us online at diolundesigns.com. Hi, this is Rob Barnett, CEO and founder of VinVillage.com and the Wine and Dine Show on Vin Village Radio. Do you have a wine, event, product, or service to promote? Then contact VinVillage.com to reach thousands of wine lovers across the country. VinVillage connects like-minded wine enthusiasts with unique and exclusive wines, events, products, and services. To learn more, contact us on VinVillage.com. VinVillage is where wine lovers connect. One person has the power to change the world, impact millions of lives, and leave a legacy for lifetimes to come. That person is you. In the New York Times bestseller, What is Your What? Steve Ulcher, award-winning author and founder of the Reinvention Workshop, reveals his proven process that has helped thousands of men and women discover, share, and monetize the one thing they were born to do. Grab your free copy now at www.whatisyourwhat.com slash free. That's www.whatisyourwhat.com. Dot com forward slash free. Take a break from politics. Tune in and learn something. WS Radio shows are worth your time and are filled with tips and advice. Add us to your lunch routine and we'll give you a meal for your mind. Small businesses are the lifeblood of America's economy. Every Thursday, SBA Radio interviews industry professionals and is dedicated to provide small businesses with timely insights and innovations. Visit www.sbaradio.us for details. Tired of presentations with no impact, no inspiration, and no traction? Do dull speakers have you and your team disengaged and distracted by smartphones? Christopher McAuliffe brings energy, insights, and two decades of experience delivered with punch, humor, and heart. Your team will leave energized, uplifted, and with a sense of purpose. Visit ChristopherMcAuliffe.com to bring some heat to your next speaking engagement. M-C-A-U-L-I-F-F-E. ChristopherMcAuliffe.com. 
in me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. Welcome, neighbors, to Vecinos with your host, Maria Garcia. Welcome back to Vecinos. My guest today is Ricardo Flores, who's the executive director of LIS. And he has been talking about how this program helps San Diego, what it can do for a community. But I'd like to talk a little bit about, will it change City Heights? Will it change Barrio Logan? What are some of the changes we can expect to see? Yeah, I think what you're speaking to is gentrification, and it's it's actually something very very important to Lisk. You know, so Lisk is a we've got 30 offices around the country where we have a huge footprint, and so part of that though we're in very different markets. So for example, my colleague in Detroit, uh, the challenge that she faces as the executive director is that she can't get they can't sell homes, they can't sell properties out there because the the value that they're worth is too low that the banks won't even underwrite these things. Whereas in California, we have the complete opposite. We have skyrocketing rents. But because of that diversity of work that we're doing, we also are able to study what we're doing and to see what's working and what isn't working in real time. And so we have what's called the LISC Institute, and we are actually looking at gentrification and trying to understand what can we do uh, as an organization because we know that bringing millions of dollars into a community 30 years ago was a wonderful thing, and everybody was really excited. But now the questions become, well, that's still great, but what's going to happen to my neighborhood when you do all this? Who are you actually trying to market to? Is it us or people from the outside our community? And so that's very important to us as well, and that's something we are thinking through when we're talking about doing these kinds of investments. Um, you know, one of the ways that w for, our, for us, our goal is really affordable housing. We know that if we can get you into a home uh, into an apartment or whatnot, if we can get you into that uh, the stable home environment and you're able to live there, you can't be gentrified out. Uh, and so that's why for us it's really important that we continue to build as much affordable housing as possible, uh, that we continue our efforts to try to help individuals buy homes um, because obviously that's a, that's a, it's a source of wealth for the American family. Um, uh, and, and also just really understanding that when we work in communities and we work with the businesses is to really work with those small businesses in those communities. Um, because not only do we provide loans for housing, but we also do loans for small businesses as well. And uh, specifically minority and women-owned businesses, we're trying to target those businesses. But again, you can't come into a business like that and say, here's money. You have to come in with a little bit of technical assistance and a little bit of best practices. But again, it's trying to build those groups up so that they stay in those communities. They continue to serve those, service those communities. So what's going on in City Heights and what's going on in Barrio Logan and Sherman Heights? Tell us about it. Well, we see change, right? I mean, we see change everywhere, incredible change. Uh, you know, so we, we have, we work in, we're in City Heights and we work in City Heights. We work on the El Cajon Boulevard corridor. Uh, for us, corridors are very important uh, because they're a source of economic uh, growth for a community. Uh, it's a place where a community can essentially come together. It's a place where a community can buy. My question, what is the El Cajon Boulevard corridor? Basically from where to where? So we, we work essentially from the 15 all the way up to like 54th Street towards the college area. That's sort of where we're at. Uh, it's sort of the area we've sort of unofficially adopted. Uh, and we're, what we're doing is we've brought together stakeholders in that community, the City Heights CDC, the International Rescue Center, Media Arts Center, a lot of other groups that work in City Heights, brought them together. And essentially, we said we should all work together to try and do something with this quarter. Our El Cajon Bid, El Cajon Business Association District as well as a part of this. Um, and we created a, a placemaking place right there next to uh, the YMCA, the Copley YMCA and it's got a uh, thing called the dojo on there, and I believe it's Ernie McRae's son, who actually has a coffee shop there. Um, and we pr there's programs, it's an you know, there's programs that go on throughout the week and whatnot. Uh, and the idea is just to create a space for people to come together. Um, and again, to create a space not just for people, but for these organizations to come together. Because that's the other thing, is you notice a lot of, t oftentimes, organizations work in their silos. They have their different issues. But when you look at them in the aggregate, they're all doing one thing. They're doing community development. They're either doing community development with arts or they're doing community development with uh, training programs or they're doing community development with the actual development. But they're all doing some form of building the community. And so how do you get we, – we got them together, their idea. 
let's do something with this open space. We've done it. And now we want to take that to the next level where we're able to look more holistically at that El Cajon Boulevard corridor uh, and see if we can't actually spur change for the community. Again, affordable housing and retail. What kind of retail are we talking about? And affordable housing, are they homes? Are they apartments, condos? What are we talking about there? So I think what you're going to see on El Cajon Boulevard are more apartments only because of the limited space. Um, and it's zoned actually to to be able to build apartments. And if, if the city of San Diego... Um, like all jurisdictions in California, have to tell the state where effectively people are going to live. So if you live in North Park, it's no surprise that you're seeing a lot of change in your community because that's essentially where the city of San Diego has said we're going to increase density to allow for people to live. Um, so you're going to see probably more sing- more more apartment-style living, multifamily-style living. Um, when it comes to businesses, I mean, there's already businesses there. you know, And, and the El Cone Corridor has what's called the Little Saigon District. And very well known to a lot of people in San Diego. Don't know how many people actually go to Little Saigon on Friday or Saturday night. So there's already establishments there, restaurants, um, coffee shops, uh, places to purchase certain things, uh, cultural amenities and whatnot. W- our goal isn't to replace that. It's to build that up to ensure that those businesses are doing well and to really m- to figure out a way that not only are the people in City Heights going there, but how do you get the folks north of El Cajon Boulevard, Talmadge, Kensington, how do you get them to patronize that, those areas? That's really important because that's economic development, essentially. And so if you're bringing money into a community like City Heights and the people that are working in these businesses are City Heights folks or, they're, or, or longtime business owners, you're actually improving the economy of that local area as well. So it, it's, it's, it's a sort of a holistic approach uh, to, to development. We all know about Little Italy and the economic development that's taken place. Is this kind of your vision for Little Saigon? Or well, what is your vision for Little Saigon? Well, or not yours, but yeah, the, community's the community's vision. You know, that, that's what we're exploring right now. So one of the things that we're interested in doing with LISC is um, we're interested in trying to uh, do two plans. One's called Redevelopment 2.0, and the city's currently doing that in Otay Mesa. Uh, and then also what are called environmental impact reports. And what those are, is it would be kind of an overlay on portion of, of El Cajon Boulevard. They would effectively tell developers and those property owners, if you're going to build something, this is the way we sort of want it to look like. The community would come together and decide this. We want you to build up to the sidewalk. We want you to have uh, housing on the top, preferably affordable housing, retail at the bottom, um, in the Little Saigon District, you could see as uh, so uh, you could also see the uh, reflection of architecture reflecting the community there. So that when you're in that area, you look up and you look around and you go, "Well, this must have been some historical area." Very similar to what's going on with Chicano Park, or what happened with Chicano Park, which is now you know 100 years from now, maybe Latinos may not necessarily live in, in that community, but there will always be the story of Latinos and Chicanos in that community and what that meant and how that community meant for them. Same thing with the Little Saigon District. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully partnering with our city to be able to say, if, we're, if we build affordable housing, will you make it easier for affordable housing developer to build something there? Will that be something that would be helpful to them? But also senior housing. Um, there's a lot of folks in the community, City Heights, especially in the Vietnamese community, they're seniors and are looking for places to live as well. Um, but it's really taking control of the community, of uh, the area. You said, uh, you know, in the community, do Viet- the, or the Asian population as a whole, how how are they dealing with their seniors getting it to that age? And now it's a different than before. Now they're working, a working community. How, what are you seeing there? It's interesting. So the Vietnamese community is, uh, you know, that, that next generation has grown up, right? That first generation came here and that next generation has grown up. And so they're sort of now taking the reins and more in charge of, 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 of um, some of the organizations there, but also some of the businesses there. Um, and I think what you're seeing is an interest from them to preserve their culture, but also to expand their culture. Um, you know, I like to tell folks when I was growing up and there was, you know, my birthday was coming up as Black Angus. I love Black Angus or Hungry Hunter. But now there's such a diversity of food out there. And I think that Americans, while we may not travel as much <laughs> as others, what we do is we experience culture through our mouths, through food. And I think that, you know, whereas maybe when you were growing up and you were from X country, you didn't go off telling the, your friends in elementary school that, hey, mom and dad are making this at home because they, 
maybe the kids won't understand it. Now it's, I think, a, a, it's a positive thing. Diversity has become more of a positive word. And the idea that you make this for Christmas or for New Year's, wow, tell me more. I want to try it. I want, and so I think you're starting to see that also within the Vietnamese community. They want, wanting to share their culture, wanting to share what they have, what's, it, what's a part of them. Uh, and so it's exciting. I think that's really exciting. And, and really, again, the idea is, how, you know, City Heights is so well branded as the community's community, right, that everyone around the world lives here. Uh, and I think when you talk to business people, branding is really important, right? And if that's, that's been branded already, so how now do you bring that out? And again, the idea that I go back to is, you know, it's Friday or Saturday night, and what do you want to do for dinner? Vietnamese, Mexican, Italian, you know, that's the way we look at the world. Why not have a piece of that for City Heights where people, folks say, you know, I want to go have a good Vietnamese meal, or I want to go to have a good Somali meal, or a good Mexican meal. Why not bring that out? And, and, and you can see that by doing that, you're, you're actually spreading that culture, and you're spreading people's understanding of that culture. And how far can you take it? Can you take it to the arts? Um, can, you, can you do it where uh, you know, you're creating a space in City Heights where, you know, I've heard a lot of folks, um, a lot of community folks talk about this kind of a museum of some sort to preserve the cultures there, but also to share about the cultures there. And so this is all very important. And then all of this, again, ensuring that community is a part of it, and building that affordable housing. Okay. We'll be back in a minute to discuss. I'd like to get into a little bit into Sherman Heights as yeah. well. Thank you, Ricardo, for being here. presentations with no impact, no inspiration, and no traction? Do dull speakers have you and your team disengaged and distracted by smartphones? Christopher McAuliffe brings energy, insights, and two decades of experience delivered with punch, humor, and heart. Your team will leave energized, uplifted, and with a sense of purpose. Visit ChristopherMcAuliffe.com to bring some heat to your next speaking engagement. M-C-A-U-L-I-F-F-E. ChristopherMcAuliffe.com. Take a break from politics. Tune in and learn something. WS Radio shows are worth your time and are filled with tips and advice. Add us to your lunch routine and we'll give you a meal for your mind. I raised $8,000 to build schools for South African children. After realizing how many people go hungry in San Diego, I now volunteer at a food pantry. I'm spending the next year doing volunteer projects across three countries and helping in ways they designate to be the most helpful. The World Link program at the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice recognizes the potential of youth as agents of social change. Learn how you can help youth become a generation of leaders in action at peace.sandiego.edu. Attention business owners, if you feel like your business owns you and want to grow your company and get your life back, then get the Scale Toolkit at ScaleYourBusinessToolkit.com. Created by Wall Street Journal bestselling author David Finkel and Priceline.com co-founder Jeff Hoffman, this free collection of 36 videos and PDF tools will help you build a business, not a job. Go to ScaleYourBusinessToolkit.com today and learn how to work less by getting your business to produce more. Small businesses are the lifeblood of America's economy. Every Thursday, SBA Radio interviews industry professionals and is dedicated to provide small businesses with timely insights and innovations. Visit www.sbaradio.us for details. If you heard that sound, you probably are eligible for insurance from Navy Mutual, insuring the men and women of the Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. Here's what one policyholder, retired Navy Commander Thomas Dade, had to say. Navy Mutual is the best insurance decision I ever made. I wish you had a savings plan available that earned the rates my Navy Mutual insurance has been earning. Navy Mutual Aid Association, started by military members in 1879, serves active, reserve, and retired military today. Navy Mutual honors our military by providing them affordable life insurance with the features they need without fine print, sales fees, or military service restrictions. Value, integrity, trust, and stability are the cornerstones in which our commitment to you and your loved ones are built. Call Navy Mutual at 1-800-628-6011 or NavyMutual.org for your personal life insurance plan consultation. 1-800-628-6011 or NavyMutual.org. 
Navy Mutual, ensuring those who serve. Talk to me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. Welcome, neighbors, to Vecinos with your host, Maria Garcia. Welcome back to Vecinos. I'm here with Ricardo Flores, and we are going to talk a little bit about the, the development in Sherman Heights, because we that's another community. I was a vice principal at Sherman Elementary School in the early 80s, mid-80s, and the change has been tremendous. Would you like to talk a little bit about what we've seen changes in Sherman Heights? Yeah, no, I, I, Sherman Heights is a it's a precious community. It's a gorgeous community, and it, it's a really evolving community. Um, uh, you know, I think that the last census reported that more folks, uh, you know, Caucasian folks are actually moving into that community than moving out of that community. And it was really one of the pla- one of the few places in the in the county where that was happening. Um, but you know, you, you know why? And it's beautiful proximity to downtown. You've got these beautiful Victorian homes that at one point were sort of the country home for the folks in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, again, I think that when we look at a lot of those communities, how do you preserve the culture that's there? How do you preserve the people that are there? And those are some of the real challenges. And I think when we look at that Imperial Corridor, that's exactly right. I mean, um, you know, you look at the, the structures, they're all built right up to the sidewalk. It's perfect for for people kind of strolling back and forth. The question becomes, is there anything to stroll to? Is there anything the other to go to? And so that's sort of the important part of that. And, and, and again, how do you, you know, communities like Sherman Heights and Body Logan and Shadid, they have buying power. It's not as if they, they don't have any buying power. Um, and so how do you create restaurants or amenities that, that, that cater to that, um, that, are, that, that uh, bring the community with that? And I think... Sherman Heights is an is an interesting story in that the change has happened so quickly there, kind of like Body of Logan, where it's kind of I think it's kind of gotten people kind of caught off guard in some ways, um, and I think it's you're seeing more and more of it, uh, and so that's really where a group like List can come in and really be able to say, okay, let's work together, and again, let's work with the Sherman Heights because the Sherman Heights Center is actually a community development corporation. It's actually set up as a CDC, um, but working with a group like that saying. Let's try to figure out a way to build your capacity, and can you go out there and buy a piece of land, partner with a developer, affordable housing developer, build affordable housing, preserve some of the families that are living in that community. Again, can we work with some of the businesses that are already there, help them out? Small businesses, uh, especially Latino-owned businesses, their ability to get credit or access to credit is really very, very low. Uh, And so can we work with those groups? And, And a lot of times, it's interesting, you think that just because you have uh, money to offer or loans essentially to offer businesses that they're going to be excited to take them. Not necessarily. Um, they're like a lot of us. I mean, if you come and you know, show up in my house and you say, hey, for a certain amount of money, you know, sign this contract, I start to get nervous. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're getting me locked into. And same thing with other, with all folks, small businesses as well. And so it's really building that relationship with them. Uh, and that's why we work through groups like the Sherman Heights Center and others to really talk to businesses and to be able to say there's access to capital, there's access to money. And, and the other thing, too, is what we're seeing in Latino communities, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurialism is large, it's huge, right? People really, especially immigrant communities, really take advantage of the fact that they may not necessarily have the skill set, the English and all that, the background, but what they can do is they can work hard. They have a product offer, which is oftentimes their cultural background, uh, oftentimes they they know how to do things that have been passed down fam- from their families. And so they have a resource there. It's how do you monetize that resource to give them the stability for their family. That's all real important. And that's sort of, that's really what we do, we're trying to do at List to try to unlock that potential. And again, it's the same thing with the Sherman Heights Center. Um, how do you unlock the potential of a community, especially a community that's changing so quickly? Uh, side note, when I was uh, vice principal at Sherman, it was a rough community. Mm-hmm. There's no two question about it. It, it. But I loved it. It mm-hmm. was a community I really loved. I, I've never worked in a community I haven't loved. When they were getting ready to close the school to build the new school, I was called back. And I remember coming out to playground duty, and I looked across the playground down towards downtown, and the change that I saw, it was drizzling, and I could see the ballpark. And that wasn't my view when I was there before. And as the tears started coming down my eyes, just seeing the transformation and what was being offered to this community where the kids could now walk to a ball 
mm -hmm. gained. They could do things that were so much different than if mm -hmm. you just 20 years before. It was a big change. What about Buddy Logan? What are you seeing there? Well, Buddy Logan, I mean, that, that has really changed. I think for any of us who are from San Diego and have watched that over the years, I think we're kind of shocked oftentimes when we go back and we think, my goodness, this wasn't here before. I never saw this before. Uh, a good friend of mine actually owns that um, a restaurant there, Salud. Um, and so, I mean, that, even that itself, I mean, if you look at that restaurant itself, a uh, good friend of mine, he had a the San Diego taco company or taco shop and, and you know, did a lot of family events for us. And, um, and then all of a sudden he opened this restaurant. And then within the first year or so, it was very much the talk of the town. People, ah, oh, have you gone to Salud? And again, how much that's changed that little area. The line to get in is, reminds me of Cuatro Milpas. Yeah. And then across the street, you've got Border Acts. I mean, you've got this whole kind of organic thing. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about community economic development. How do you create the next Salud, the next Border X? Organic organizations, uh, preserving a culture that's there, providing an amenity that reaches beyond their uh, community there. How do you do those things? And, and really, it all comes down to that individual, that entrepreneur, the business person willing to take that risk. My friend Ernie, willing to go out there every single day, open up and close and sell tacos and beer and whatnot, and really working hard. We at List, we're fortunate because we'll come in and we'll help finance it, but someone's got to do that hard work. And But what a, what a value he's bringing to that community and to that area. Uh, and, and I think those are the kind of changes that communities are interested in seeing because it preserves who they are and where they're from. Um, and in Body Logan, that's going to be, that's the struggle, I think, right now, right? I mean, you, it's a small little area that's got a lot of important people, people on the port. Um, and then you've got the community itself, uh, or, or the, not the port, but the, um, the waterfront there. And so how do you preserve that for the community uh, and for generations to come. And more importantly, how, I, I think when we talk about communities, oftentimes we're, we're talking about is people saying, I was here. I existed. My story is valuable. And, you know, gratefully, folks, generation before my parents and others and you and others, worked hard to create Chicano Park. And that will always be a symbol of, of the Latino community here in San Diego. Um, and that's really important, and it's really important. And, and I think more so than that, it also creates, I think people are interested in diversity of going places and, and experiencing new things. And I think that's what a community like Body of Logan offers. That's what Sherman Heights offers. That's what uh, City Heights can offer, Little Saigon community. All of us, it's just a diversity. It's, it's adding another uh, something to our uh, co uh, community. And I think we're starting to recognize, and even though I know that politically speaking, it seems like we are going backwards, I still, in my belief, is that people are really interested in where people are from, and they're interested in diversity, and they're interested in experiencing that. Uh, apart from what we're hearing nationally, I still think there's still an interest. Um, Some people still see it as a salad with many good flavors. <laughs> Yeah, 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 you know, and, and, and it's salad that's changing. I mean, look at California. I, I was telling someone the other day, uh, you know, I went, when I was in college in the 90s, um, that's when 187 was passed, I believe. Yeah. And, I mean, you fast forward 20-some-odd years later, and we're now a sanctuary state. I mean, you know, in the 90s, we were kicking folks out and saying you shouldn't be here. If you, and, we, we were very, and we were targeting people, right? We were saying women and children, we don't want you going to school, and we don't want you going to get the health care. Right, mm -hmm. but if you're going to work, that's fine. But yeah. other those things, we don't. And then fast forward now, and we're a sanctuary state. All these changes that are happening, and again, we're seeing th that's a political change or con uh, you know, it's conscious change. But in communities, we're also seeing that change. And so, how do, again do we how do we preserve what's there and, and preserve the people that are there? And that's really the mission of Les. You know, I am. Um I go to Chicano Park from time to time, especially just people from out of town to show them the park. Or sometimes when I'm working on an article, I'll go take a picture for a certain purpose. But one day I'm, I'm at the park, and here comes a tour group to Chicano Park. I know, the yellow trolley bus. Who ever thought yes. a tour group would be going to Chicano I Park? And I, I mean, I've, I've had, you know, I know some of the people who do give tours, and I know they've done it for schools and for... But a tour bus from Balboa Park coming to bring people to Chicano Park was amazing to me. I've seen it myself, and I was just as shocked as you are as people are taking pictures. It, 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 the people, you know, people are interested in understanding, I believe anyway, 
understanding other people. Um, and I think we see that again when we look at food, when we look at uh, when we look at you know what people are drinking and eating and all that stuff. I think it comes from that. Um, and, and I think there's just a, a hyper awareness of it uh, more so than there was in the past. I th- definitely, I think that people have been so open to this and to preserving the murals. And I, I know it's one thing to see the murals from the freeway, but when you're under those, the bridge and you're looking at the beauty and the size, it's, it's overwhelming. Things that I know I took for granted in my college days, oh, that's very nice. Now it's overwhelming and it's beautiful, and it's also on uh, on the national art uh, registry. That's so right. that's another very important that's thing right. in the art community for sure, and in our community especially. Absolutely, and then, you know, and then it also when you when you when you talk about well, why murals? What was the interest in doing murals? And then there's a rich history in Mexico of muralists, right? And then what muralists did to explain the story that they were involved in, or the mm-hmm. times that they were involved in. And again, it just all that just begets more questions, and I think all of that at the root of all of that is. I was here. I existed. My story is still alive. Um, I think that's all of what what we're what we're doing when we do when we preserve those things when we do those things. And again, it's the same thing with food, right? I mean, uh, my wife and I are big fans of Anthony Bourdain's show, and he goes all over the world. And you know, it's like a passport, right? We just kind of go all over the world with him. But it's traditionally you see it's food that people have passed down from their families. Thank you, Ricardo. We'll be t- our last half, and we'll talk about what the future looks like. Thank you. Absolutely. On the internet, your business's reputation can be unjustly destroyed in an instant. Don't wait for that to happen. Building and marketing your five-star reputation can increase your business by as much as 19%. Take control of your reputation and have the five-star reputation you deserve with Reputation Marketing Solutions by DSI Development. Become the go-to company by visiting 5starrepmarketing.com. The number 5starrepmarketing.com. Hi, this is Rob Barnett, CEO and founder of VinVillage.com and the Wine and Dine Show on VinVillage Radio. Do you have a wine, event, product, or service to promote? Then contact VinVillage.com to reach thousands of wine lovers across the country. VinVillage connects like-minded wine enthusiasts with unique and exclusive wines, events, products, and services. To learn more, contact us on VinVillage.com. VinVillage is where wine lovers connect. You've heard me talking about Progressive Medical Center. They have helped me feel my best. And Dr. Gulley, tell us a little bit about integrative medicine. Why is that such a big deal at Progressive Medical Center, and how can that make me feel better? Integrative medicine is just good medicine. It's combining the best of traditional medicine, nutritional medicine, natural medicine, and really helping the patient get to the root cause so they can take control of their health and really make an impact to improve not only their energy, their vitality, and just their overall outlook on their health and their life. I procrastinated for a long time before I finally made an appointment. So why should someone not delay and go ahead and get set up and come see you guys? Any journey begins with that first step. And that first step means making a decision to recognize that there's something wrong with you. Whether you have fatigue, inappropriate weight gain, not sleeping well, not concentrating, all of these issues, you can get to the root cause. So many of us here at The Fish have gotten help from Progressive Medical Center. So why don't you find out more from them today? Go to ProgressiveMedicalCenter.com. This is your life, live it well. You take your smartphone almost everywhere you go. Now WSRadio.com can be there too. Search WS Radio in the Play Store for your Android devices or iTunes for Apple and download the WS Radio application. WSRadio.com on your phone and in your ear everywhere you go. Download the WS Radio application. Do it now. It's very easy. WSRadio.com. Attention business owners, does it feel like your business owns you? See if you qualify for a free 90-minute business coaching session to help you build a business, not a job. During this free 90-minute strategic consultation, one of our senior coaches will help you map out the best way to grow your company and get your life back. To learn more, 
Go to MauiMasterminds.com slash scale now. That's MauiMasterminds.com slash scale now. Talk to me. Information, news, and entertainment on demand. Welcome, neighbors, to The Sinos with your host, Maria Garcia. Welcome back to The Sinos. You're listening to WS Radio Internet, the leading radio in Internet radio. And I have today Ricardo Flores here, and we're going to talk for our last segment what the future looks like, not only for City Heights, but for Lisk, for him. What are the plans in the next two or three years for that community or for the San Diego community as a whole? Yeah, so we're really excited. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're putting together a $50 million housing affordability fund. Uh, and I mentioned that really LISC, our, our forte is in the pre-development land acquisition. So that very first space, buying a piece of land, buying a piece of property, hiring architects, you know, finding out what the, what the, all, all the, um, the zoning is. And it's, it's really, if you look at the affordable housing financing world, there are three steps. There's that pre-development land acquisition or purchasing land. There's a construction loan, and then there's the permanent financing loan. The construction loan, that centerpiece, is very well taken care of by our banking partners uh, around the county. Um, they understand that work. Um, but where we see a huge gap is in that very first portion of it and in that last portion of it. And so what LISC is trying to do is we are trying to create a fund uh, to tackle that first part of it. Because that's if you can't even buy a piece of land or you can't even start the project, then there's no project. Um, and so our, what we're doing is we're putting together a fund, a low interest loans, long, uh, higher loan to value. Um, again, we're you know, patient in terms of you know, repayment and all that good stuff. Um, for us, the goal is how are you affordable? How is your project affordable? And how are you going to pay us back? What's your story? And, of course, if you're a developer, you should be able to do both of those very easily. Um, but And this would be really important because, again, the goal, the other part of this is that San Diego, as we've seen over the years, is changing politically, but we're still very adverse to assessing ourselves for additional resources, especially if we need resources like affordable housing or homeless or whatnot, right? And... Uh, what we're doing by creating this fund essentially is we are trying to bring that money that's in New York and floating around to San Diego to put it in the form of loans and to get those loans out on the streets to start building this. And the other important thing about this is that these monies could be used as matching money. So Tony Atkins very you know, wonderfully, her and Brian Mainshine, uh, who voted on this as well, put $200 million dollars uh, for the state of California uh, to build affordable housing. Um, that $200 million, Sacramento is going to want matching money. They're going to say to localities like San Diego, great, we want you to have some of this money as well, but where's your matching money? And unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of matching money here in San Diego. And so this $50 million fund would be, able, would be helpful in that respect as well. And so again, that's a big picture look at what we're trying, at, at something like affordable housing, uh, because we know it's such a dire issue here. Uh, on a more micro, macro level, uh, again, we're working on that El Cajon Boulevard corridor, bringing the communities. And one of the things that El Cajon Boulevard, especially where City Heights, um, from the 15 all the way to 54th, is that you have a community to the north that is economically different than the community to the south. And you don't get that in San Diego. I lived in L.A. I went to school in L.A. I mean, you can go from S a Sunset Boulevard by UCLA, uber, uber wealth, to Chavez Ravine in downtown one street. You can do that in Hollywood. You can go down one street and it will change drastically the environment, the economy. Uh, we don't have that in San Diego. If you live in certain communities, you're kind of isolated from other communities. Well, not, necess not here in, in, this, in the mid-city area. You can go from the Kenzie and Talmadge, which are strong middle-class communities, all the way to City Heights, which are strong working-class communities. And really, there's one street that brings them together. It's called El Cajon Boulevard. And so we want to work with both those communities to say, there's, we can do better on El Cajon Boulevard. Uh, we need housing. We, we need, we need uh, retail. We need uh, businesses. To, we have businesses there, but we want, them, we want to keep investing in them and make them thrive. And most importantly, can we bring these two very diverse communities together to plan a vision for a f the future, for their community? Because either way, 
they're both right next door to each other. And so can that happen? And I think that's of real interest to list to do that for a whole host of reasons. Um, my wife and I are members of the YMCA, the Copley YMCA there that Mr. Price was very generous to provide funding for uh, him and he, he and his family. And when you go into that YMCA, it is very diverse. I mean, you look at the parking lot, there are, uh, you know, very expensive cars, and then there are folks biking there. And and you go inside, and you've got, you know, uh, you've got folks from all sorts of different parts of the community coming together to exercise. Let's take it the next step. Let's take it to where people actually are willing to go to Alcombe Boulevard to, uh, to restaurants for retail. Uh, how can we continue to bring these two communities together? Because in... in and I know you know, uh, Maria, that there's a whole host of reasons why these communities are, com- are connected, uh, let alone just the fact that City Heights is a younger population and that north of Kensington, or north of El Combo, is an older senior population and all of the, ne- the necessary uh, connections there for the future, for Medicare, Social Security, all those things. Uh, talking about City Heights, City Heights is really what San Diego will look like in 30 to 40 years. Uh, the investments made in those communities are not investments just in those individual individuals or those communities. They're investments in San Diego. Um, and so th- all these are really important questions to ask. And, and I think that what, what you and I both know of San Diego and probably some of your listeners is, you know, we are a scrappy little city who is continually trying to prove itself. But the one thing we do do well is we know we have to work together. Because we're far away from Sacramento, we're far away from D.C., we're in a cul-de-sac down here. You go south and you got the, you got Tijuana, you go to the west, you've got the, the, uh, the ocean, you go to the east and you've got mountain ranges. So we're, we're kind of in this little cul-de-sac here, and we understand that. And so can we work together as a community to solve the problems that we face? And I think we can, and I think that LISC in, in, in our efforts in community development can help bridge that. Because as, as the other thing that's really important is success breeds success. And if we can get communities to come together to do something successful for their future, it can happen anywhere else. We can do it in Sherman Heights. We can do it in Body of Logan. We can do it anywhere. Um, we just have to do it, and that's really important. Is there land available in the City Heights community? Not that much land. Um, but, you know, I always try to tell folks, you know, if you look at Manhattan, I mean, I don't know how many millions of people live on that little peninsula. Yeah. Uh, you know, the fact is that we're going to things are going to look different. You know, the, the city, the city that I grew up in, um, you know, the single story city that I grew up in probably you know, at some point isn't going to look the same way. And that's OK. That's what happens. Um, we're going to see a different way of, of, of living in San Diego. Um, the question, I think, for all of us and for communities, especially like City Heights, is, can they be a part? Can they can they vision? Can they have a vision for that change and help implement that change, uh, or are they just going? Or, or, or like we've done in the past, will change just sort of happen and then one day we wake up and realize, well, wow, it's really different around here now. Um, and can we? Can we, and most importantly, we talk about city governments and we talk about state governments and federal government budgets, and they're just never what they should be. And yet we have this incredible financial sector. We have more wealth in our country than we've ever seen. We've got more, we, you know, we track the idea of having billionaires now. You know, there's 20, 30 billionaires. Uh, we've got more millionaires in this country, more in this state, really. That money is sitting in people's bank accounts or investments around the world. How do we open that money up? How do we get it to inner inner city communities? And how do we allow them the opportunity to really decide what their event, what their interests are, and that's really the philosophy at list. How do you unlock that all that potential capital? Um, and it's really important that we do that. Ricardo, first, I'd like to thank you for being on the show and for bringing all this information to us. I'm a little overwhelmed with the information, <laughs> as I'm sure everybody <laughs> else is, but I, I'm I'm excited because I think that we'll see really good and exciting changes in the community. One last word. Is there anything you'd like to say? Well, I wanted to say thank you for having us, having Lisk, having myself, and also thank you for doing this show. I think it's important um, because I think it's important that we have dialogue, especially in a time now where it's somewhat antithetical to not dialogue. It's sort of we're screaming at each other, and I think it's great that you're doing this. And most importantly, uh, is history. You're capturing that history of our community. Thank you so much, Ricardo. I'll see you next week, and I really do appreciate you thank being you. here.
podcast or radio show on WS Radio is a great way to create content marketing. Turn prospects into customers, into raving fans. Contact Wade at wsradio.com or call 866-WS-RADIO. Kenja Dixon was crowned the number one sales executive through hard work, deep thinking, and the revelation of universal talk laws. He now wants to share these lessons with you. Universal talk laws are what you need to know and use in business and at home to have successful and effective conversations. Kenja Dixon shares his wisdom, action plans, and wealth. Each book comes with a chance to win $10,000. Find Universal Talk Laws at KenjaDixon.com. On the internet, your business's reputation can be unjustly destroyed in an instant. Don't wait for that to happen. Building and marketing your five-star reputation can increase your business by as much as 19%. Take control of your reputation and have the five-star reputation you deserve with Reputation Marketing Solutions by DSI Development. Become the go-to company by visiting 5starrepmarketing.com. The number 5, starrepmarketing.com. Hi, Scale Listener. This is David Finkel, co-host with Jeff Hoffman of Scale Your Business. I wanted to let you know that our newest book, Scale, was just released and to encourage you to get your copy. The book will give you seven proven principles to grow your business and get your life back. If you've ever wanted to grow your business but held yourself back from fear that it would take over your life, then we urge you to get your copy of Scale today. It'll give you a proven roadmap for rapidly growing your business while also gaining more personal freedom. Scale will help you work less by getting your business to produce more. Scale is for every entrepreneur who ever wondered if they really own their business or if their business owns them. Get your copy online or at your local bookseller. For more information, visit us online at scaleyourbusinesstoolkit.com. That's scaleyourbusinesstoolkit.com. Controversy and conversation to upset the status quo. A no-holds-barred exploration and obliteration of the limits of possibility. Join me, Steve Olsher, and my rambunctious crew on Reinvention Radio, where each week we scour the planet to bring you the world's foremost social, business, political, technology, and scientific disruptors who challenge the accepted and forge daring, cutting-edge paths. That's Reinvention Radio, where normal comes to die and mediocrity meets its final demise. Hi, this is Rob Barnett, VinVillage.com, where wine lovers connect. Be sure to tune in weekly to VinVillage Radio for exclusive, in-depth interviews with the who's who in wine and food. 